So again, um, welcome everybody. And I'm uh, Arn finouster Beard, and I'm the global head of the TCS Academy. And the TCS Academy is the, the training and certification arm of the Consortium for Service Innovation. And I'm pleased today to introduce Patrick McBride. And Patrick is the product manager for the sales demo services at Oracle. Um, and he's going to show us how he led an effort to use TCS to optimize uh, sales support. And Patrick, for many of you probably remember Patrick, is uh, this is his third TCS in action sharing best practices. And he has over a decade of experience as an advanced uh, TCS practitioner. Um, he spent most of his time implementing KCS in customer support environment, uh, and I had the pleasure of uh, uh, working with him there, um, but found uh, principles and practices also worked well when he moved into the sales area. Um, and we've actually seen many instances of KCS working well outside of customer support. So certainly we have countless um, IT and HR KCS implementations, but, but really KCS uh, is knowledge is a byproduct of the interaction. We have interactions everywhere. Um, so legal facilities, customer success, uh, implementations, to name a few, and it's nice to see uh, Patrick uh, implementing this in the sales area. And, and as Patrick talks, you're gonna recognize a lot of the common challenges that any KCS implementation faces, um, as well as the benefits received overcoming those challenges. Um, you're also going to see some great uh, TCS uh, best practices that Patrick has created over the years um, that you can leverage in your application also. But some uh, housekeeping before we begin. So this session is being recorded uh, and will be posted on the consortium site uh, as well as sent out to all who have registered. And uh, please uh, make sure that you're on mute and put your questions in chat. And so we'll be monitoring the chat and we'll either answer them in the chat. Uh, is Erica on, uh, Patrick? Um, I don't see her yet. Okay. She well, should be I'll, on email. I'll definitely, um, one of uh, Patrick's employees will be on um, and can answer. I'll, I'll also be monitoring the chat as well as uh, Sarah and Kelly. And so we'll uh, do our best to answer them in the chat, bring them up to Patrick in the flow, but we'll also have time for Q and A session at the end. And then wanna make sure you're aware of upcoming consortium and academy events. And so Sarah Feldman will be posting the link in the chat for our events page for all of our upcoming events. And uh, actually we're finalizing, I'm personally working on um, several for October, November, and December. So this is always a, a great link to, to have. Um, but I'm very excited about today's event and pleased to pass it over to Patrick. All right, thanks Arfin. So let me get started. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about Oracle's KCS journey. So we have been a long time member of the consortium. I've been Oracle for, gosh, it's about 20 years now, so a long time. Um, and Oracle's been using KCS pretty much the whole time. So uh, we have a fairly mature program in our global customer support space, which is really where most of our focus on KCS has been over the years. Um, we have you know, 10,000 plus agents who have uh, a couple of years ago when I was still in that space, we had you know, well over 600,000 articles. We have 97% of our customers who come in to get support and use knowledge um, don't end up logging a service request, which is uh, you know, a great stat. We're very proud of that. Uh, we also have a global IT group, which is the internal support function for you know things with problems with network access or computers or whatever. Um, and they use KCS as well. Um, but um, one of the cool things at Oracle too is because we're a pretty large SaaS company, we have uh, two products that actually um, have KCS as a uh, part of their design that we have Oracle B2C service service cloud, which has knowledge advanced. And then we have a B2B service product as well. Um, and that I'm going to touch on in a minute made life a little bit easier as I was working to uh, implement KCS within this organization I just joined a few years back. So um, what is that organization? So this is a group at Oracle called Demonstration Services or Demo Services. Um, so Demonstration Services is a group that provides um, our sales engineers uh, who demo our SaaS products for customers. Um, the, we provide a platform for them to request environments. Um, that are pre-configured with a reference implementation. 
Um, and then they're able to go into that reference implementation, make some changes um, to meet the unique requirements of the customer, the industry, um, and then deliver a demo out of that environment. Um, so we pre-configure those environments. A lot of times we'll set up integrations between multiple SaaS products that Oracle has so they can demo how you would use those together. Uh, we provide a whole library of demo collateral that's like scripts that tell you how you can deliver that demo and what content to use. And we have fictitious users that you can log in as and, and demo as those individuals. Um, and then we have a dedicated sales support team that helps resolve problems with those demo environments. So sometimes, um, you know, they've configured something that's not quite working and they run into the same problems our customers would. Um, but because, um, you know, the, the, that configured environment is, you know, consistent, we decided to stand up a support team specifically to help our sales team separate from our global support team. Um, so that team is there and we have a sales operations team. They're, they're the ones that deal with, you know, uh, integrations and, and all the back end, you know, refreshing it when we have a new content uh, release or refreshing it when we have a new code level that we're dropping um, and we want to make available to our sales team to demo. So that's a little bit about demonstration services. Uh, why did we do KCS? Uh, so we started this support function really as an extension uh, at the time of our team that put together all the demo content and collateral. And they decided they needed a support team to field all these questions so they could focus on you know, building the demo content. So the support team you know, kind of started growing as a, a function. Um, and um, over time, you know, they, they um, the products line expanded and we started seeing some growing pains, right? Where we had, um, a, since it's a small team, we had a whole lot of products and the more products you have, the more difficult it is for the people who support those to really know everything about all those products. So um, scaling became a challenge for them. It was also built by sales engineers who really didn't understand the support function um, exceptionally well. So they didn't understand best practices that like the consortium provides. Um, and then the new VP came in and looked at this and I had previously worked with him in the sports space. And he said, you know, we have an opportunity here to really make this a more modern and efficient organization. So that's, he reached out to me, asked me to join his team and that's uh, to help, you know, bring KCS to the sales uh, function. And that's kind of how I came to be in this space. So um, just a little bit about kind of the journey that we've been on. So we started um, with a support running on an Apex platform. Apex is a low code platform that Oracle provides to build applications. And, and because this support team kind of evolved as opposed to being designed, um, they basically had a few developers who threw together this platform and, and it just continued to evolve and expand over 15 years. Um, and so that's where we were when I joined the team. There was no formal knowledge program. They just published service requests uh, for other sales engineers just to search through a search engine. Um, we had separate repositories for the service requests. We had demo scripts. We had feature briefings. We had a lot of content, but it wasn't organized well. Um, we also had no review. Like, how do you review and manage the content? We had no process for that. Um, and really no expectations for how to work and document service requests, which was a real problem that we had to deal with early in our program. And I'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, I said very few documented processes. So, you know, we had a lot of tribal knowledge of you know, how do you reset passwords and how do you, uh, when is it okay to give customers access to a demo environment if you're doing a demo and things like that. But we didn't have a lot of that written down in formal, easy to find ways. And so that was a real opportunity for us. Um, so now we're three years into the journey. Um, we've implemented Oracle Service Cloud product. That's the B2C service product um, and the Knowledge Advanced tool. Um, we have service request guidelines, quality guidelines that we've aligned with KCS and the PAR process. Um, and I'll touch on that in a minute. Uh, we have well over 10,000 knowledge articles and we have right now six different content types um, and we'll be expanding that in a little bit. I'll talk about kind of our future roadmap in a second here, as well as at the end of the presentation. Um, and then we have a brand new site that we stood up. Um, we built from scratch for our end users to access our demos and request a demo environment, request integrations, um, and also access the knowledge and support site. 
So what's where are we going next? Um, and again, I'll, I'll end the presentation going more into this, but um, our plan is to take this beyond the sales support function and really look at the selling process. So we see a tremendous opportunity with KCS to look at things like how do we sell and get more consistency in that, right? When you have a global sales team of thousands of people, um, inevitably they're gonna have the same types of requirements from many customers um, or the same industry type of requirement across multiple customers. And we really didn't have or don't have a process that's um, super efficient at allowing them to share, right? We have Slack and people are pretty good at sharing things on Slack and communicating, but there's no easy place to just say, I have a hundred requirements, I have the demo, how do I find solutions for those? So we're looking for ways to drive more consistency that should in turn lower the cost of preparing to demo to customers. Uh, we can drive solutions back and do our reference implementation. So in a normal KCS in the support world and a SaaS model, you know, when you run into issues, you're driving uh, solutions back, maybe your development team to build features or into your implementation to change your setup. We're gonna be driving solutions back into those reference implementations so that we can more easily demo from those. And then over time, we wanna track the gaps. So sometimes you can't demo, you don't have that capability. Um, right now it's difficult for us to understand where those gaps are unless people um, raise their hand and tell us. So here we're gonna have the opportunity to really see where do we have those gaps and then see what the opportunity is to invest in those areas and improve our, um, our ability to satisfy all the requirements our customers bring to us. So um, how, how did we get where we are now? Um, we, the very first thing I saw when I joined the team is I started looking at um, the service requests that our team worked. So um, I started opening up and reading them and I realized pretty quickly that um, I, I couldn't really understand what was going on. Um, they didn't write down uh, what, what they were doing. They were really good at jumping on the phone or getting interacting with the people, but they didn't stop to say, this is the problem I'm gonna solve. This is what I've done. Um, this is the solution that I found. And so obviously if you wanna implement a, a knowledge program, you've gotta be able to know what, what you're gonna write. And we didn't have that as a baseline. So um, we implemented uh, SR quality guidelines kind of built around the PAR process um, to measure the quality of the service request as a foundation for then adding KCS on top of it. Uh, we trained coaches in our organization on that process um, and then turned around and trained support and used those coaches to reinforce that process of how you needed to document and work your service request. Um, and then we created a scoring model um, that we called um, our, that's our quality index. Um, and the coaches used that when they interacted with each individual on the team. Um, but one thing that was really effective is we did a random audit each week and just grabbed I don't think it was a lot. It was like maybe a 30 service request. And we would just review them and score them um, and publish a number and a trend line and, and a goal. And this was hugely effective for us in getting adoption um, because we published this on a public Slack channel. Um, all the managers and support knew this was a critical goal. Our VP who brought me in to implement this would jump on there and say, you know, we gotta do better, you know, make this happen. And that was a huge reason why they started actually doing what we were asking them to do. Um, one thing that was interesting when I joined the team is they had had um, several efforts to implement um, a knowledge program in the past that had failed. Um, it really failed for a couple of reasons. I'll talk about this in later slides, but you know that, that executive support, but really the lack of a program around it. And that's what KCS provides. So we brought in the knowledge capture. Um, and um, again, at this point we had implemented uh, Oracle Service Cloud B2C service um, and, and knowledge advanced specifically within that um, for authoring. Um, so we had a place for them to start creating content. Um, we seeded it with a very small number of issues. We went back and looked at the service request people were regularly going back to and tried to populate something so there would be something in the knowledge base. Um, but then we kind of went back and retrained our coaches on exactly how to do knowledge um, and knowledge creation um, and repeated what I talked about before. So this is an example of um, the measures that we used. And um, we had basically five key components that we looked at. The attributes, 
represent things like, you know, what product, what kind of uh, product or industry, other attributes about the ticket um, did we know? So we wanted to make sure that um, that those attributes were correct because obviously that gives you a lot of good insights um, when you're doing your downstream analysis of you know creation. Are we doing really good in one particular product space but not in another? Those types of things. Um, did we understand what the issue was early on? Uh, so we we always ask our team to document the issue as they understand it as the very first interaction that they have. Um, do we have evidence that they did research? Again, we want them to use our knowledge base. And so we really drove this hard. Um, do we know have the cause or the solution documented in, in the ticket? And then um, the accuracy of the solution was the most important part. Um, and so we would look at the accuracy being, you know, if you wrote an article and it was exactly what the symptom was and the solution, you get full credit. If you use a solution and, and I could easily find that solution by searching on the issue as you documented it, you get full credit. Um, if you didn't document anything, you obviously get nothing. And then we had lots of uh, wiggle room to give people partial credit if they link something, but it was hard to find still, you know, things like that. So you would get some score uh, for linking, but maybe there's a huge opportunity to improve that knowledge article. We wanted to drive those behaviors. Um, so this is what then made it up into the chart I had on the previous page and allowed us to progress until we felt like we had kind of knowledge embedded in the culture of our support organization. Okay. So next up was a support site. So um, we are we built out a completely new platform for our sales team to use to request and access our demo content and demo environments. Um, so as part of that, we stood up this support site um, and so the support site consists of a knowledge component and a service request component built on Oracle Service Cloud. So the knowledge piece um, has, you know, a search component and a browse component. And I think this is an important part of any design as you're putting up a site is to understand your audience and what they're searching for and what they're browsing for. So problems, how to's, those types of things people try to search for and they do, uh, they'll use the search bar for that. But when it comes to scripts, you know, we provide the ability for them to browse into, let's say, uh, human capital management and see all the scripts that we have grouped by the type of feature. So benefits, what are all the scripts we have for Oracle benefits? Um, so they can see all of those and then choose from those and browse those as opposed to having to search. Um, so that was an area we felt like browsing made sense. User guide for our site, because again, how do I request a demo environment? How do I request an integration? Those are all capabilities on this site that this is a, a component of. And people um, you know, traditionally browse into that type of content. Um, I have something called briefings, which is basically a calendar type of view of all of the briefings that we're gonna have. Maybe when we stand up a new release and you know, we release content um, so people can demo those new features we just released. Um, we do these hour long briefings and this allows them to go in and see what's coming up and what we've had in the past and watch recordings and things like that. And then known issues, you know, um, Oracle delivers the, um, the latest code to our sales team first. So before it goes to any customer, it goes to our sales team. And oftentimes that's before we fixed all the issues that came up during QA. So we have a known issue section just to help our sales team avoid running into problems that maybe haven't been resolved yet in those um, early phase releases of new code. Um, this is a way for them to easily find those and then determine if you know that's that's a feature they have to demo. Maybe they want to go on to the previous code version and demo out of that until that issue is fixed. So this um, is, again, something that we felt like people would want to browse into more easily, um, as well as the, the search option. Um, for service requests, um, we have pretty much the standard service request UI. It's a little unique in that we have um, kind of, we allow them to choose the, the environment they had their issue with. And then there's a whole bunch of attributes that'll conditionally appear. Uh, we did implement, which I think is a best practice, you know, recommended answers. So as you're describing your issue, um, you're gonna have recommended answers and hopefully that deflects um, service requests because people see the answer and realize they don't actually have to press submit. They can just read the answer right there in line. Okay, um, 
we also looked at expanding the model to other channels. So in the support space, a lot of times you have communities and other things that people interact with. Um, since this is a mostly internal solution, uh, we looked at where do our sales engineers go. Um, and one of the places they go is a Slack channel we set up for them when they have critical need for help. Um, and we really wanted to embed um, KCS into this as well. So um, we took something that was shared in a uh, KCS presentation by Zendesk, um, I guess it was a year or two ago, um, where they basically used an emoji to sort of start tagging their there's um, their Slack channel threads. And those those emojis uh, denote several things. They denote where you answered it with knowledge or where you need to create knowledge. So you can create rules inside of um, Slack. So when you tag it with a certain emoji, it will generate a separate thread of knowledge that needs to be created. And so we, we actually have embedded that into our knowledge capture process. We've also trained our support team, again, to answer in the context of knowledge. So you know, I searched the knowledge base, they gave a link, they found an article and a solution from our knowledge base and provide that as a way that they answer questions. And that's the expectation we have of our support team. And this has really helped us to drive people to our knowledge base as um, a place to go. Um, again, we didn't have a culture of using knowledge to solve issues. So um, we really wanted to kind of drive that, um, that model um, through the interactions that we did have. Um, so there's a question in chat about, you know, did we make the knowledge base the most prominent thing on the site so people see that first? Um, I'm going to jump back here before I go on. So because because our site is uh, is not just a support platform, it is the actual site people use to access their demo environments, um, to add users to their demo environments, um, to get the credentials to log in, and all of the, a whole bunch of other things. Um, it didn't make sense for this to be the, the place that they land. They start on the site where they access their environments, um, but this is easily accessed from that site. Uh, we provide visibility into the existence of service requests and the existence of knowledge as it relates to um, the demo they're delivering. So if you're delivering a demo on our Fusion HCM stack um, right in line in that demo, and I don't have a screenshot of this, you'll see demo scripts and collateral that relate to that um, particular demo you're delivering. So knowledge is, is intimately integrated with the actions that they're taking and the steps that they're doing, but they do have to come over here if they want to interact with the support, traditional support functions, like if they have a problem seeking an answer for. All right, um, so it kind of leads in, <clears throat> talked a little bit about Slack just now. Um, so how do we drive adoption? Um, we're still in the process of doing this, and I'll talk a little bit about our adoption um, metrics later. Um, but a key to this was really putting self-service as a, as a top of the list item that we talk to when we have our calls with our sales team. So you know we have these regular calls with different sales teams to talk about the environments and how many, you know, what kind of uh, environment capacity they need to, to demo to our customers. Um, and problems that they're encountering. And, and key part of that for us is putting self-service adoption and capabilities and solutions that we have right in front of them in those calls. Uh, it really helps them to see um, you know, the, the, the impact that our knowledge has on our ability to solve their issues. And having those conversations with them you know, has been an essential part of, kind of bringing the visibility of the knowledge base up in their eyes. Um, I already showed you how we document every interaction with answers that reference back to knowledge. Uh, but one of the things we also sought out is, um, is because this was new, um, our, we have, uh, like anyone that uses Slack, you probably have a proliferation of Slack channels. So we have Slack channels all over the place that our sales teams talk about. There's ones for you know, products like HCM, there's ones for people who demo HCM and healthcare, um, very targeted channels. A lot of our support team were already engaged in those channels. So we asked them to jump in, not just to answer questions, but to answer questions with knowledge and also to create knowledge from those conversations saying, you know, I saw this conversation happen with an answer provided and I created an article and posted in there. And again, it just drives, reinforces that that's an option and, and that they can start thinking about our knowledge base, uh, which we found has been helpful to get, get people to start using it. Um, in terms of our service cloud 
implementation. Um, there's a few things that we did that I, I wanted to call out. I've talked about these um, in the context of global customer support in previous sessions, but um, I was able to implement similar solutions inside of Service Cloud. Uh, first thing was an automated search. So uh, with our support team, we asked them to restate the problem right away when they get a ticket. Um, because a lot of times the person will say, I'm getting an error when I'm doing X and they'll upload some screenshots and log files. Uh, but they didn't put the error message in the ticket. So um, if you don't extract all that information early on, you're you, you're going to not really know what problem you're trying to solve and you might go down the wrong path. So we really wanted our support team to do that early. Um, so what we do is we have a, a field that's empty and we make them fill it out before they can save the service request. By filling that out, it triggers an automated search based on this statement that they describe the problem. That automated search presents the solutions over here. Um, and you can see the top solution here matches the problem that they have here, and it allows you to quickly get your answer if it's a known issue. So um, that's been a huge benefit for us um, in really driving our support team to restate the problem and use knowledge early on. <clears throat> it also eliminated the need for us to pester them to go search the knowledge base because the knowledge base search happens programmatically for them. And all they need to do is just look at it, um, which is kind of taking one of the barriers down to adoption. Um, the other thing is during um, uh, closure, uh, we prompt our users to share a solution. So I don't have a screenshot of this, but this is from our internal UI. When the, when the person, our sales engineer, goes to close a service request, we actually ask them um, to tell us what, what like, I'm going, I need to close this. And we say, okay, did support solve it? Did you solve it? Or are you just canceling this because you don't need help anymore? Um, if they pick, I solved it myself, a box pops up and asks them to share their solution. Um, and it's just a simple step that we wanted to add because we really wanted, we found a lot of times they would just close it and you had no idea how it was resolved. Did, did the solution I give you fix it or did you fix it yourself? And because we, this is our employees, we felt like we could ask them to do this extra step of sharing this with us. And it's allowed us to increase the amount of knowledge capture because we're getting the solution more frequently or we're knowing that the support solution that was provided actually resolved it. <clears throat> also, when you close the service request, we force you to do a classification. Um, this is again, something we implemented in global customer support that I brought to this team. Um, and when I say classification, we basically are asking you, um, did you solve it with existing knowledge? And if so, what, which piece of knowledge? Uh, did you create knowledge? If so, which article? Uh, or did you say knowledge wasn't relevant? Because sometimes it's not, right? Sometimes it's some unique, really bizarre corner case and just doesn't make sense to write an article on a release from three years ago that somebody happened to be hanging on to and nobody's going to encounter the problem anymore. So, um, you know, we do give them this option. Um, and then sometimes, you know, people request support and then say, never mind. And we, we don't really want to categorize or look at those in the same context as everything else. So by classifying these at closure, it puts you in a position where you can measure now programmatically. And if you think about, you know, the typical coaching model, you've got your coaches going in and looking at two or three service requests a week um, and giving feedback maybe to the people on that they're coaching. Um, we felt like this really gave us um, some great insights um, at a much broader scale of the work that people were doing. So from this, I can look at a team and let's say I have an HCM team and I can say 60% of the HCM team's issues are resolved by knowledge. They're creating knowledge at a 10% clip, 5% of the time saying knowledge not relevant, 15% of our issues are canceled. Um, that's my baseline. Now John on the team um, only has 25% solved by knowledge. So now I start to ask the question, what's going on with John? And I maybe have my coach go start working with John and work with him um, to do a better job of searching, um, to do a little better no job of knowledge creation. Um, and I get John fixed and, and working properly. And then all of these metrics shift and, you know, you work on the next person. So it allows you to do much better targeted coaching um, within your organization and gives you kind of some free insights that usually are pretty expensive um, to capture when you're talking about doing it after the fact with the kind of a coaching model of looking at all the tickets. So um, this was a huge benefit within our global customer support space and we found it equally beneficial within our, our uh, sales demo space. All right. 
So phase one, uh, we feel like we've kind of finished phase one. We're moving on to the next phase of our implementation. Um, what made it work um, and not work in the past? Um, that VP that brought me over and said, we're gonna do this. Um, if I didn't have his sponsorship, I don't think the people would have fallen in line and done the work. We, they tried it two or three other times, never gotten the traction behind the people using the knowledge. It was about having a program and a methodology with the executive support to make it happen. Because I would just send him you know, the update and say, hey, we're kind of stagnating and people aren't making progress and improving. And then he would send an email out or join their team call and, and drive home the message. And all of a sudden you see a big jump the next week. Um, and we did that repeatedly, um, measured the impact, measured the adoption, um, put those numbers out in public spaces and um, you know, put it front and center on people's objectives for the year. And without that, it wasn't gonna happen. Um, so if you're trying to grassroots your program and you don't have these things, um, you know, I, I think all three of these things are essential to the success of any KCS program in any organization. So some impact, um, we're three years in, we have about 10,000 knowledge articles. So given the size of our support team, um, I think the support team's probably 65 people um, globally supporting dozens and dozens of uh, SaaS products. Um, to have 10,000 articles is a pretty big accomplishment. Uh, they're solving 65% of the issues with knowledge. Um, we have 35% of our monthly users using knowledge. Um, so I'm gonna to touch on that as a challenge, but also I wanna clarify how this is different than that 97% I talked about with global support. The 97% was people who were seeking answers um, we're finding it in our knowledge base. Here, this is of all the people that come to our site to access demo environments and do these things, 35% um, of them utilize knowledge, which doesn't mean that all of them had problems and only 35% use knowledge. It means that some of them had problems um, and, and trying to figure out which percentage of those use knowledge you know, is, is a bit more difficult because there's so many other sources they can go to, which again is one of our challenges that we're gonna tackle in phase two. Um, one of the huge benefits that we saw was a um, huge reduction in onboarding time for sales support. So they're almost effective the day they start now because of the knowledge base. We can have them clarify the issue, you know, see the solution in the knowledge base, especially when there's errors and, and provide solutions pretty quickly and effectively. Um, another thing that it's, I didn't put on here, but a huge benefit is um, because it's a small support organization, um, and because we have so many different SaaS offerings at Oracle, um, it's difficult to have um, additional coverage. You know, the expert on our transportation management solution goes on vacation. We didn't used to have any anybody to fall in their in their in their space and, and pick up at the same level that that person, that expert, was able to provide support. But because of the knowledge base, we're now capable of answering most questions that come in. Uh, even without that expert there. That person's still the best at resolving um, new issues as they come up, but um, since most issues aren't new, they're known, um, it really allows us to become effective in, in scaling our support organization to cover more products and features. <laughs> uh, from a challenge perspective, um, you know, we, we really targeted this against our support function first. Um, but we, there's so many other repositories that all the different sales teams have put together. They have their own little micro groups within Oracle of, you know, like I said before, the, the healthcare team that supports our human resource product maybe has a site that they stood up and they have a bunch of information they put on that site. But then there's another team um, in Europe that does a similar thing. And, and so all of these teams that sort of over the years stood up all these sites with different content um, and because there's so many places to go, it's difficult for us to get people to consistently come to our site and publish to our site. Um, and then also the structure of the content that we create um, from our demo content, the scripts and all of those things, um, isn't always aligned really well with the way that we sell. So we provide a great script that says, here's how you can demo this and, and experience. But then the customer asks actually for something that maybe starts a little earlier and ends a little later and has 10 extra things lumped into it. So how do we provide and restructure that to really align with the way that 
our sellers sell. And this is a similar problem you're gonna have with documentation, right? Uh, product documentation in the SaaS space um, doesn't always align with the reality of, of how you do what you do. Um, so there's an opportunity that's similar, but also a little bit different um, that we're gonna try to tackle next. Um, some, some challenges that we had um, were, you know, we already had this hugely successful knowledge base for our global support team. And we didn't want to duplicate that. Um, so one of the things we really wanted to think about was uh, what does it mean to create knowledge in demo services that, and how is that different from global support? And so the, the key thing for us is ours is really an implementation similar to a customer. It's a reference implementation we use to demo from. So our knowledge base is all about documenting you know, the persona that we're demoing as. We have you know, fictitious users that we created um, the flow that we're demoing, um, the issue that you might encounter when you're demoing in that flow or the, the, the extension you're adding onto that flow. So everything we write, uh, we try to anchor in and around the content from our, our, um, our demo material, basically the, like the implementation that a normal customer saying. Um, we had to rethink knowledge. So, you know, knowledge obviously is problems and how tos but knowledge was for us was also thinking about our users, um, you know, what does it mean to be a user, um, a sales engineer user, and, and what are they doing? What is their job? Um, and what kind of things do they interact with? And what logically of those things they interact with belongs in our knowledge base? So that's where we started stepping out and saying, hey, we do all these briefings, maybe we should make those part of our knowledge base. Because as you're searching, it wouldn't it be great to know that there was a briefing on that very topic that you're searching for information about? Um, we, we rolled in all the demo scripts because the same thing, it's not good enough to just know there's a, how do I demo this feature, but then also that we already have scripts and insights and configuring and all those types of things that are part of our demo collateral. Um, and then what does the KDE role look like in a sales function, right? So in my role previously in support, an acknowledged domain expert would improve and refine content, would create scripts to diagnose issues, but they would also drive solutions back into the product. Um, what is our product in sales? And our product in sales is um, the demo environment itself and the pre-configured use cases. And so that's a key focus of what we're trying to do is see their use, see the gaps and drive the solutions back into them. Um, and then, um, what do you do when you realize you know your the key contributors contributors aren't part of your captive support team, right? And so I touched on this a minute ago, like the the people that really contribute a lot of uh, solutions and capabilities um, that make it into the actual demos aren't actually part of our support team. And so how do I get them to actually contribute content? And again, that leads into our future opportunities of what's next. So um, over the last year or so, we've been doing kind of a deep dive of trying to understand our audience better. Um, what do sales engineers do? How do they work? Um, what are their challenges? You know, where do they, how do they put together a demo for a customer? Um, and we're going to be using that to drive KCS into the field, the field selling team. Um, so a big part of that is going to be looking at all of those repositories, not necessarily getting rid of them, but making sure that everything in those repositories is sourced and lives as its primary place in our knowledge base. They can still refer to it in their site, but we want everything to live in our knowledge base. Uh, we're gonna restructure the content so it's easier to put together a demo from the various knowledge components that we store. Um, we're gonna find a way to capture our customer requirements in a structured way, um, similar to how a service request provides structure to an incident and then the solution. Um, we're going to start linking requirements then back to scripts. So what, what did we solve with existing capabilities? This is a little bit like I, I mentioned we do with the knowledge where we link um, the knowledge and classify it when we close the service request. We're going to classify our capabilities back against the requirements. So we already have it in our script. We, we had to write a custom solution and we documented it and we're referring to that. Um, we created a brand new solution or it's a gap, we don't, we don't have a way to demo that capability. And again, that'll be huge insights into our um, future investments in building out our demo infrastructure and capabilities. Um, and then we wanna measure and drive investment from reuse. So um, again, if we're seeing 
you know, lots and lots of use of um, some solution that was created by one of our sales team, sales engineers. Um, let's get that into the base product and make it easy or base reference implementation and make it super easy to demo that capability um, in the field. And we see even bigger opportunities long-term of alignment with teams like consulting. How do they actually implement it? Uh, we sell it this way, but do we actually implement it that way? And if we don't, um, and work with like, implementers and customer success teams, we see that the real way they implement it is something else, have a feedback loop in, into the sales process so that we actually demo the way that it's implemented. And also we implement the way that we demo because our, our implementation teams don't always know you know, um, the way that it was sold, right? We, we try to pass that information along, but sometimes they come at it from a different perspective. So if they can start with the basis of, this is how we sell this capability and, and then they work to implement that, kind of a bi-directional improvement process would be a huge benefit. So um, some of you might've gone to one of the sessions uh, it was two or three months ago. Um, and I think it was Sarah led it, um, it was on, product managers, product management. What is product management and you know what does it mean in the space of KCS and are we product managers or not? Um, and as Arnfin introduced me as a product manager, I believe that in, in the sense of what we're doing here, it's essential that you view this from the perspective of a product manager. I'm not just here to create KCS as a program for support. I'm here to understand my audience, which is sellers, and figure out how they use knowledge uh, effectively and where it could best reinforce the, the work that they do to make them more efficient, more effective, more consistent, um, selling the way that Oracle wants to sell and the messages that we want to emphasize and seeing the opportunity KCS has to drive that. So I view myself as a product manager, enabling the success of the selling organization um, and because of that, we're seeing these opportunities here. If I looked at myself as simply narrow focus, my job is to run the, the support function KCS, I don't think we would have ever seen these next opportunities and also looked at some of the, the content that we've unfolded into our knowledge base. So um, my vote um, for what it's worth, Sarah, is, is that we really should be product managers to really achieve the full potential of KCS within our individual organizations. Um, and so that is all I have for you today. Uh, not sure if there's any questions. I know there were a few that were popping up in chat that Erica was fielding for me. Yeah, I think uh, the Sarnfin, I think Erica did a, a nice job answering all the questions. Um, if there are additional questions, please put them in the chat. And actually, since we have a smaller group, uh, you're welcome to take yourself off mute and uh, just ask your questions. I would like to, to highlight, you know, at the very beginning, this is, uh, we see where you focused on the SR quality, SR and for others, it might be incident or case, but but really focus on that first. And that is, is so key. We see a lot of implementations where they don't have good structured case notes and uh, they don't have a good problem solving methodology. And then they try to put TCS on top of that and uh, then they often fail. And so I thought that was great that you started with the foundation. Uh, let's make sure that they are doing good quality SR slash case capturing and notes. And then it's so easy to have knowledge as a byproduct of that. Do you wanna elaborate more on that? It, was that a challenge for you? Well, I think the biggest challenge was that, you know, it was such a culture change for them. They had been working forever as you know, we always talk about the firefighter mentality. They get, they get a lot of um, personal satisfaction from jumping on the phone and solving the problem and getting them to stop and write this down. They just felt like we were getting in the way of them doing their job. And it wasn't really until we brought on the knowledge and we really started creating this content um, and they were able to reuse it that I think they saw the benefits. And I don't think if you try to take it away from them now, they would fight you for it. But yeah. at the time, you know, getting them to write down what is the issue I mean, I, I can't tell you how many debates and, and you know, people pushing back and not doing it um, in encounters that we had until we finally kind of broke people down enough to, that they started doing it. And like I said, it really took that executive level pressure of this is what you have to do um, before we, you know, broke through and got them to do it. And 
um, without that, you know, there's no way that they could have easily converted this into knowledge. It's the foundation, good documentation in your service requests is the foundation for the next step of creating the content. Um, yeah. So this is, and like you said a minute ago, I think um, for me, this is one of my favorite things is, is structuring, really setting your tool up to work for you. Um, I, I just feel like some, so many times I've seen people set up the tool and not give, not take advantage of what the power that it has to make your life easier. They, you know, they'll put in like a, uh, a linking process, but then they'll have 15 tickets linked to the service request. You don't know what the solution was. Um, they'll put in a, a, a classification maybe at the end of the SR of, you know, that it was solved. Uh, but, you know, without having and thinking about what you're going to do downstream and how you're going to use that to drive your program, you end up with a tool that is fighting against you, which is working for you to, to make your life better. So um, I think this is one thing I was most proud of in the, in the global customer support space and also um, surprised at how easy it was really to configure our service cloud site to, to do this, um, especially given how hard we had to work in, in, in the past to set that up in the, you know, in the global customer support space with an older set of tools. Yeah, and I think that was to underscore what you implemented uh, in uh, the Oracle support was so helpful where you could have the, uh, the SVP of all of support look to see how they're doing and they can see how their various VPs are doing. And then the VP, if they're not doing well, or even if they are doing well, because they want to recognize the people who are doing well, they can easily go to their teams and then the teams can easily go to the, uh, the individuals and saying, you have that line of sight from the individual to the, up to the, the senior VP and, and uh, vice versa. And, and to your point, that is, was just so beneficial. So great, and then we do have some questions. So Martin was asking, when new knowledge is captured, is it related to the SR was based on, or does that happen only once it's published? And Martin, if you, um, not quite sure, and you're welcome to take yourself off mute if you'd like to elaborate on that question. Hi, I'm on my AirPods, so they might be a little crackly, sorry. Oh, you sound um, great. Okay, I, so we're trying to implement, um, KCS uh, here at our organization. And uh, one of the challenges that we run into is um, we've just started wave two. And um, so we've got a lot of new people who are excited about KCS and the methodology and they're creating this documentation, but because they're candidates, they're unable to actually attach that to the support cases that they're creating the information on. So is that a problem that um, Patrick, you, you guys have faced or you know, how do you go about that? Well, we actually let them link, even if it's not published, we let, still attach it to the okay. service requests as, as a source. We don't prevent that, uh, but you know, the, certainly we, we also emphasize you know, rapid publication. So our, our goal is within 24 to 48 hours, we have the knowledge article published. So we don't like to have things sitting around languishing waiting for a publisher to review it um okay and we we our goal was also to make as many people as possible publishers um, some people have dropped entirely the publisher protocol we, we wanted to keep it initially at least because we felt like there were just too too much risk with um kind of low quality content and, and so but we've i would say 70 percent of our team are publishers at this point and can self-publish and so it's less of an issue now and, and Martin, most tools that we've seen allow even a candidate to link an unpublished um, candidate contributor. So it might be just configuration on your tool too. Let me look at. Yeah, that's uh, that's great though, and I think that's that actually sounds like an accomplishment in itself, Patrick. Um, so I mean, I, I like watching these and hearing more about how Oracle has kind of developed this program over the years. I've been tuning into a few of them here and there. So much yeah. appreciated. And uh, yeah, we'll definitely have to check out how this is configured uh, on our side. Great. And then there was another question uh, just asking about your underlying search engine, if it was homegrown or the uh, tool that you also sell out in the marketplace. 
Yes, I see Jeff Elser's on here. I might have to lean in him, but I know um, there's two different types of searches that we do. So there's keyword search, uh, or not keyword search, there's a, a search that you can do where you explicitly put your search phrase in and search. Um, and I believe there's a, um, uh, an elastic search kind of club search that searches the, um, the summary and compares it. Um, I don't know, Jeff, if you're... Yeah, so those are, those are both um, kind of, whole, well, they're productized, I guess. Um, they're Oracle products. So Knowledge Advanced has its own proprietary search technology with, you know, pretty advanced NLP. Um, so it's it's just part of the product. Um, it's not Elastic. It predates Elastic a little bit. Okay. Um, and we're, we're actually, our next product will have Elastic under the covers, but um, this is our older Inquirer search, I think. Yeah. And then... Uh... Dora had a question about your maintenance strategy. So what, what's your review period? How do you clear backlog for reviews and, and feedbacks? Right. And... Um, so we have, we have a 12 month cycle for uh, articles coming up for review. And so basically it just triggers an action to the, the owner of the article who's expected to then go in and revalidate that the document is still relevant. Um, we, we have a couple of things that we attribute on our content. Uh, we attribute the uh, content level and the code level. Um, so that's something that's a little unique for us. Um, content level means you, you have content that was released. Let's say um, we have a, a year and then an ABCD cycle. So let's say we have content that was released in 21A, which means 2021, the first release. Um, and then you have a code level Code level, you constantly are getting updates on, so you're always demoing out of the latest code, but you might not be taking all of the latest content. The reason is maybe you've configured something for a particular industry and you're hanging on to it because you put a lot of energy into, into that hasn't made it back into the base demo image, uh, the reference implementation. So people will hold on to those for a little while. Um, uh, the reason I clarify that is because when it comes to content maintenance, um, we don't really hold on to things very long that are related to old code issues because we force people to take those releases. But older content releases, uh, we do actually keep some of that content in our knowledge base for longer periods of time. Um, so we have kind of a review process where we try to you know, uh, cycle out the older code issues if those have been resolved, uh, but the content things will, will hang around for a little bit. Um, and like I mentioned, this um, CKI, the common known issues um, page that we have on our uh, support site right here, current known issues, sorry. Um, we'll hang on to these for um, a couple of releases um, because there's always a cycle of some of the environments have been upgraded and some of them are in the process, but we're not gonna have two or three year old issues here because it doesn't make sense because nobody can be on this code level. Um, and then we also have, the ability to provide feedback. So um, there's always a, a feedback loop. If people type a comment on an article, it generates an action and people review and implement those. Um, and just the expectation again is, you know, you're constantly updating your knowledge articles as you use them. So uh, if support uses a knowledge article and they see something's wrong and they're expected to fix it themselves or flag it and, uh, for somebody else to fix. Um, do we have any other questions for Patrick? And, and hopefully, again, as you saw, um, Patrick dealt with many of the similar challenges that uh, you all are facing as far as um, having separate repositories, a culture issue of them just wanting to help the customer, help, or in this case, help their, their sales engineer, uh, and they don't see the case as uh, case documentation or knowledge as a, a helpful piece, um, but then all the, the benefits that Patrick found as a result of implementing KCS and uh, definitely the, the best practices that um, hopefully you can take back into your organization as far as starting with that SR quality and then having that line of sight, having that, that closure wizard that uh, Patrick talked about helps quite a bit. Um, so I want to thank you all. And any last thing that you'd like to emphasize, Patrick, as far as uh, I mean, it was great to see how you've implemented this in uh, sales support, but any last words for the folks who are trying to implement on their site? 
in there? No, I, I, I think for me, the, the funnest part about this whole process was taking KCS into a space that, you know, it was, was not support, right? It was not a traditional support space anyway. It was more of a an atypical target for, for this. Yes, we had a support function and we started there, but um, I think for me, it really has been interesting to see how well KCS scales to other parts of the way the companies function. And there's so much opportunity to capture and reuse um, knowledge across organizations that um, you know, keep your eyes open for places you can plug KCS into your organization. Great. Yeah, thank you. And then Sarah just posted again the upcoming events, but you can get notified about future events if you join our mailing list. So we encourage you to do that. And you definitely don't get spammed with anything. We don't sell the mailing list. It is just uh, to notify you about the future events. So again, well, thank you so much, Patrick. And, and thanks for everyone who joined. And you all have a great rest of the day. Thanks.